Welcome, everybody, to the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show. Thank you for being part of the show. And let's dive in right away. Because I was busy planning and preparing and laying out this show today when um, I received a phone call. On the phone uh, was one of my dearest friends who raised an interesting question. And in answering the question, I said to him, Uh, You know, you are one of the very few people to whom I can comfortably say the following words without fear of retribution. And the words are that many times, if not most times, women are better off marrying for money than for love. And he laughed and he said, yes, of course, that makes sense. And then it occurred to me that this was something that, yes, it did make sense, but it was also something that I thought that would shock the majority of people who heard me saying it. And here on this show, I'm profoundly blessed to have people who do not switch off the minute I stop massaging them with warm butter. No, no, they, they listen, they struggle, they grapple, and then they evaluate. They either agree or they don't agree. And sometimes you write in and send me uh, emails on our website at rabbidaniellappin.com telling me that you do agree and you liked it or why you don't agree and why you think it, I am incorrect on a particular point. It's great. I love the give and take. And uh, I thought, you know, what we're going to talk about today is exactly this particular topic. As shocking as it is to hear, I am going to make the case that in the majority of instances, a woman, if she's going to marry for either love or money, she should rather marry for money. And uh, the reason is that uh, will there be mistakes if you marry for money? Are there thoroughly unworthy scoundrels who have a few dollars? Absolutely. And can a woman make a terrible mistake by marrying one of them simply because he is capable of helping her create a life of of worry-free comfort as she's envisaged for a number of years? Yes, absolutely an enormous mistake can be made, no question about it. However... I am quite confident that the number of times, the percentage of times that a mistake will be made when she marries for love is far, far higher than the number of mistakes, the percentage of mistakes that will be made if she marries for money. And uh, the reason, as I'm going to try and explain and discuss in this part of today's show, uh, is that uh, marrying for love means absolutely nothing. It means absolutely nothing for several reasons. Reason number one is that as one of my great Torah teachers told me many years ago, when somebody says, I love you, when a man says to a woman, I love you, very often indeed, he means it in exactly the same way I say on Thanksgiving to my wife, I love this turkey. Look, if I really loved that turkey, I wouldn't be eating it. I would be creating a home for aging turkeys. No, when I say I love turkey, what I'm saying is I love the feeling that I get when I take that turkey and consume it. And unfortunately, many times when a man tells a woman, I love you, he's talking about the feeling he gets when he takes you. That's what he's talking about. It so happens that the Hebrew word in ancient Jewish wisdom, the Hebrew word for love, I love, is the same as the Hebrew words for I give. And that's really a a fairly reliable way of evaluating what sort of love that is. If you find yourself as a man 
overwhelmed with a desire to give to this woman, not to take her, but to give to her. If you feel overwhelmed by a desire to provide for her and build a home for her, that's a different story. But if what your love expresses is fundamentally a desire to acquire her and make her yours, well, you just might be implying that you love her just the way you like a big plate of steak and fries. And so uh, we have to be very careful indeed about falling into the trap of this I love. Another reason why marrying a man who says he loves you or you think you love is that women are particularly susceptible to loving somebody, particularly somebody with whom there's already been some level of physical intimacy. Right? That's, that's just the way God created us. And uh, women do increase their susceptibility for, uh, for, for a man in those circumstances. Um, also, it should be understood that uh, sometimes uh, women feel vulnerable. And in certain circumstances where a woman feels vulnerable, either emotionally or financially or because something's happened within the family or because of a previous relationship, whatever it is, she becomes enormously vulnerable emotionally uh, to the guy who says, I love you. And she really, really believes that she loves him and she feels she does. It is very difficult for men or women to, uh, for all of us, to separate our intellects from our emotions. It's very, very hard indeed. And so when we say marrying for love, it's extremely problematic. And, uh, and, and all I can say is if, if you're a woman listening to this and uh, you're not even sure you're going to be listening to the entire program, well, then what you need to know, and I, I cannot stress these points I'm about to make adequately, uh, all I can tell you is that not only do I know this from ancient Jewish wisdom, not only do I know it from the uh, the scholarship and the records and the uh, and the studies and the anecdotal evidence, but I know it because I am a man, and uh, and that is that if you're in love with somebody, please don't accept a proposal of marriage while you're in love. It's just a really, really bad time. Now, I know this is problematic because these things can you know, slide up on you. And there you are. You're going out with somebody. And before you know it, you're starting to have feelings for him. And before you know it, time goes on and you, you realize, oh, you, you love him. And then he proposes. So what are you supposed to do, right? Say no because I love you. It doesn't make any sense. But the problem is you've let it get there too quickly. Long before that, you need to really get to know his track record. Believe me, you can tell far more about a man by his track record than you can about the words that come out of his mouth. Come to think of it, uh, that's true for politicians as well. You know far more by looking at their lives to this date than you can possibly know from the words they say to you. Uh, this is one of the reasons that a brand is so valuable. Right? There was a time a number of years ago when Jeep right, ceased to, to operate. And uh, there was a time then when the name Jeep as a vehicle, right, uh, the Jeep, uh, the, the, the company was purchased. And it was purchased for a lot of money. You'd have thought that they'd get factories and a dealer network and machines and maybe even an inventory of cars. I wouldn't you have thought that when Jeep was purchased, they'd get all these things? No, they didn't. No factories, no dealer network, no inventory, nothing except the name. That's how valuable a brand is. That's what a brand means. Do you get what I'm saying? It's something really, really important to understand. And, um, and, and that's one of the reasons that to this day, I mean, so, you know, we're becoming, I think, as we're all becoming a little more accustomed to buying generic drugs. But would you buy a generic car? I don't think so. 
I think you know exactly what, what a brand means when it comes to a car. And so it is with a, a human being's reputation. Reputation is not based on an advertisement any more than a reputation of a car is based on an advertisement. It's based on very expensively gained reputation. It's over a period of time. It's word of mouth. This is all very valuable. It's very important. And above all, it's very valid. And so it is that the reputation of a man is very important, particularly among other m- ladies. I- Gosh, please, folks, if, if you know any women, particularly young women, who are um, contemplating matrimony, who are dating or starting to date, or are, are, please, please, please get them to listen to this. Please. I, I have six daughters, and I really feel for girls. I really, really do. Um, because I think uh, they are much more vulnerable than men in so many different ways. This is one of the reasons that the good Lord set things up so is that men propose to women, not the other way around. You know why? Because if a man gets turned down, it's part of being a man. Suck it up, guy. Toughen up. You're just going to have to take it on the chin. That's all there is to it. But when girls get rejection, it's shattering. It's not shattering. When a guy gets rejection, it builds up his masculinity. It's a good thing for a man to have to go through rejection, not just romantically, but also in sales. I mean, if I had my way, I'd make everybody, no matter what you were going to be doing in life, go through a year of work in sales. It's wonderful because you learn how to handle rejection. But I think that's much better for men than for women. And... uh, I must tell you that I I feel for women in sales, I really feel, because uh, I think it's shattering rejection, which happens all the time in sales. Rejection for a woman is absolutely shattering in a way it isn't for men. And uh, the the idea is that that, uh, when men propose to women, women have the option of saying no, and, and that's okay. But if it was the other way around that women propose and men say no, it's heartbreaking. And there, there are horrible, horrible um, videos on the web of, uh, of proposals that go horribly wrong. And many, many, many of them are uh, women proposing to men. It's a disaster. Because first of all, the overwhelming majority of men run away from a woman who proposes to them. Because part of the uh, entire challenge part of the beauty of of marriage for men is the chase it's the victory i won her i won her and uh, and men want to feel that that they won the woman if she throws herself at them there's nothing there she doesn't fulfill the fundamental need that we have for marrying women we want the feeling of we won we got you and, um, and, and so it's one of the reasons that women proposing to men simply doesn't work, not even close. Uh, okay, uh, we're going to move right along with this exactly uh, the same topic as, uh, as we come back in just a moment. The website, RabbiDanielLappin.com, you will find on the website, in the store, you will find a product called Madam, I'm Adam. A married decoding marriage secrets from Eden. If you haven't heard that yet, or if you know somebody who's in the matrimonial phase and hasn't heard that yet, that's something they need. Uh, otherwise, in general, a lot of resources available on the website of Ancient Jewish Wisdom, every single one of them designed for practical application to enhance your life. So take a look there at rabbidaniellappin.com. That is what I do, and uh, your satisfaction is the only way that I put cornflakes on my breakfast table. So uh, take a look there at rabbidaniellappin.com. I'll be back with you in just a moment. Don't go anywhere. Your rabbi again. I'm Rabbi Daniel Lappin. Thanks for being here at the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, where I reveal how the world really works. And obviously, one of the ways the world really works is with male-female relationships. And uh, uh, one of the aspects of male-female relationships is the idea of um, uh, what I call polarity, right? It's part of the way the world works. Uh, What I mean by that is that 
uh, energy results from polarity. So if you have a hydroelectric project, and one of the great hydroelectric projects that if you ever travel uh, around the state of Washington, you really want to take a look at is Grand Coulee Dam on the Columbia River. And uh, Grand Coulee Dam is uh, it's a wonderful hydroelectric project. But one of the things you see very clearly when you tour that dam is that the way hydroelectric power works is you have to have a dam wall. And I don't mean that as an expletive. That is a noun, D-A-M. you got to have a dam wall. And on one side of that wall, you got to have water level very high. And on the other side of that dam wall, you got to have water level very low. And if somebody comes along and says, we're egalitarian around here, we believe in equality, we're going to have to have the water level the same on both sides of the wall, well, guess what happens, right? The turbines stop spinning, no more energy, no more electricity, and in the case of Grand Coulee Dam, uh, devastation for the entire aluminum industry of the Pacific Northwest. And so, yeah, you've got to have it like that. A battery has a positive terminal and a negative terminal. A sine wave goes up high, it goes down low. Uh, An electrical socket has uh, one um, terminal pumping out the electrons and the other one taking them back. Uh, You've got to be able to have the positive and the negative. You've got to be able to have a, a magnet has a North Pole and a South Pole. The only reasons you have lines of force is because you have a North Pole and a South Pole. When you spin a a loop of wire in that magnetic field or that magnetic line of force, you generate electricity. That's how your car alternator works. It's how a generator works at your local utility. That's how a nuclear power station works. If you spin a, a coil of wire within two South Poles or two North Poles of a magnetic, it doesn't work. Right, it only works when you have opposites, a positive and a negative, a putting out and a taking in. And what could be more descriptive of the fundamental sexual roles of male and female? Right, one puts out, one takes in, and it's it's as clear as could possibly be. Uh, when women marry for love. It's a real challenge. Uh, One of the reasons is that uh, love is a changeable emotion. And uh, I I believe that most studies on the subject, and I don't trust studies, most studies or any studies, but this one sort of sounds about right when they say that it takes about 18 months. That's all, 18 months for the first flush of love to vanish. In other words, if a relationship is based entirely on love, it should not be shocking if after a period, and people, people who marry for love are then completely flabbergasted. Like, what's happening? What's happening? I, I, I thought we'd be in love forever. Yeah, look, if you based uh, your entire, if you based your entire uh, relationship on love, yes, I can understand you will feel devastated when you suddenly feel that love is diminishing. But if it's based on something else entirely, well, then that's completely different. And uh, and all I can say is that the old Beatles song, All You Need Is Love, don't you believe it? Nothing could be further from the truth. That is simply not the case. Love is very changeable. And it's not all you need. Not at all. As a matter of fact, uh, addressing myself now to uh, particularly younger women who are uh, matrimonially focused, please, please, please have other men evaluate the man you are thinking of falling in love with. If you've already fallen in love with him, I think my advice is wasted. But if you are planning or thinking or considering the possibility of falling in love with him, please, please get other men's view of him. Not other women. Not other women. No. Get men's view of him. Maybe your father. Maybe your brothers. Maybe you have some platonic men friends, to whatever extent platonic even exists as a reality. But uh, maybe people he works with. But what matters about a man is what other men think of him, not what women think of him. Okay, really important. And so um, 
uh, this, this is all by way of saying that marrying for love is fraught with problems. It's intrinsically unsound. We don't marry for love. I know it is made popular uh, by the culture. I know it's been made popular by entertainment. But those factors alone should be enough to convince you that it's wrong. After all, what else that the culture tells you has turned out to be true? What else that entertainment has told you turns out to be true? So why on earth would you think that marrying for love is true? There's absolutely no reason to believe that in any way whatsoever. Therefore, it raises the question of how about marrying for money? And why do I think that that is a better bet? It's not without risk. I, really? You know, we've spoken about this before. Uh, you marry because of somebody's character. You marry because of their, ch I mean, chiefly character, um, family. All right, somebody who grew up in a healthy family is much better equipped to build a healthy family. You know that. Um, uh, marrying somebody who uh, who has a sense of humor, well, that, that helps. But uh, these are all the crucial and really important things. Uh, marrying for love, it's, it's a problem. Now, marrying somebody you really feel you could get to love, <laughs> that's wonderful. But, um, but I think that if somebody has these, uh, the, these characteristics we're talking about, uh, the love is it will come. It's it's quite possible for there to be love, but uh, to make this commitment uh, because you love the person, as so many women do, which allows them to push to the background aspects of character, aspects of what other men think of them, aspects of what sort of family they came from. All of the oh my goodness, how scary that is! But why do I think that you've got a much better chance? a far better chance of marrying for money because it tells you so much more about a man than simply the fact that you fell in love with him. Really. Let me go back, if I might, to um, the book of Genesis. And again, look, there are many of you who listen, and I appreciate it, who, for whom the Bible is no more significant than uh, the latest issue of Farmer's Digest. And that's saying something, because I kind of like the Farmer's Digest. But, uh, but, uh, but still, even so, it's probably of use to you to at least know from where my information comes. In other words, why do I speak authoritatively? Simply because a book that has shaped the lives of people for 3,000 years, a book that has sculpted entire civilizations and cultures for 3,000 years, says something. There's some value in that, I think. In other words, if it had been disproven by now, I'd have known about it. And so uh, that is why... I sometimes, only occasionally, take you back into the workshop out back, and I let you see how the information comes together, as opposed to simply letting you be out front in the showroom where I show the finished product. But back into the work workshop, and uh, there we've got the story in Genesis chapter 24, of uh, Abraham's servant, who happens to be called Eliezer, showing up at a well, sets up this uh, set of parameters where if a girl comes who offers to water his camels and to give him something to drink, etc., 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 that's the girl. And in uh, chapter 24, verse 22, Rebecca comes along, seems to fulfill all the parameters. And what's the first thing he does? Right, The first thing he does is he gives her a ring um, of a becca is its value. The word becca is used very rarely throughout the five books of Moses. And so the technique we use for understanding the meaning of a word by seeing its context and where else it's used doesn't have a lot of value over here. But whatever it is, it, it tells us he gives her two pieces of jewelry, uh, or actually three, a ring of, uh, of, of a becca, and two bracelets of the weight of 10 pieces of gold. This is very bizarre stuff. What's even more bizarre is that she agrees 
to marry somebody she's never met, whose emissary is this man's father's servant, who's just shown up. And sure enough, in verse 58 of that chapter, the girl says, yeah, I'll, I'll go with him. I'll go and marry this man I've never met. And by the way, she's, no, she's not a nobody. She's not a, uh, a mindless piece of fluff. She's, she turns out to have a far better insight into reality than her husband does. She recognizes the difference between Jacob and Esau. And uh, she takes uh, steps that literally shape the future of the Isra- Israelite people. Uh, she's, she's, no, she's not a nobody. And yet she says, all right, I'm going to go. Weird. Weird. I mean, you know, the nature of women has not changed that much since the story happened. Neither is the nature of men. And so why on earth would a woman agree to marry somebody, sight unseen, somebody she's never met? And in any event, why does Scripture, which is so careful about words, bother recording the precise nature of the jewelry why couldn't it have just said hey you know what he gave her some jewelry turned her head she got completely overwhelmed she hadn't seen such beautiful jewelry and that's what did the trick no it's very specific a ring whose value is becca which is not a word that has a meaning anywhere else in scripture but it does have a numerical value of 172 a becca is made up of three hebrew letters a bet, a kuf, and an iron, 270 and 100, 172. Anybody who is well versed in ancient Jewish wisdom knows that every number, in, uh, every number uh, has a specific association. And the number 172 means something very specific. What does it mean? Let me tell you coming back in just a moment. Uh, as usual, I remind you of what our website is. It is rabbidaniellappin.com. I'm, I'm sure you get tired of me telling it to you. You could probably tell me already that it's rabbidaniellappin.com. But I tell it to you because I encourage you to go there. I encourage you to make sure you are subscribed to Thought Tools. Um, if there's ever going to be any change to my schedule, any change to uh, uh, broadcasting, any alternative things I'm doing that might be of interest to you, that's where you'll hear about it on Thought Tools. So a uh, free weekly email you can get from me. You just subscribe to Thought Tools at rabbidaniellappin.com. You can also take a look at the store, see what resources are on sale uh, right now, what resources there are that could possibly address a challenge you are facing in your life right now. The one thing you can know about anything you buy at rabbidaniellappin.com, anything we produce or anything we commission or anything we sell is always going to have practical application in improving your life in four areas, family and friendships, faith, finance. Uh, Okay, quick break. I'll be right back with you. Welcome. It is the Rabbi Daniel Lappin Show, uh, where I am trying to make the argument uh, for your edification, for your benefit, for your entertainment, and for your overall delight that uh, for a woman, hey, none of what I'm saying applies to a man, okay? Guys who marry for money get what they deserve, and uh, it seldom is good. But women who marry for money that is a whole lot better than marrying for love. That's the case I am making. And uh, it's one that I believe to be absolutely true. Otherwise, I wouldn't tell it to you. And I'm uh, bringing uh, some information f- where the story is rooted in the Bible. And, uh, and so there we are, uh, Genesis chapter 24. And the uh, Abraham servant gives the young girl the specific jewelry. And the description is far more than would be needed. This is one of those cases where if this was simply a piece of fiction, most readers would say too much information, right? He could have said, I gave her some valuable jewelry. I gave her some nice golden jewelry. But to specify the actual weight of the, what for? Who needs that? And especially using a word that doesn't appear to have a meaning, but it does have a numerical value. It has a numerical value of 172. And to anybody versed in ancient Jewish wisdom, you say the word, the number 172, and honestly, even a child, a child would say, yeah, 172, number of words in the Ten Commandments. That's right. Wow, okay, interesting. All right, next. Uh, he gave her two rings with a total 
weight of 10. What does that suggest to you? Now, it's very important to know that in ancient Jewish wisdom, a point is made, a very strong point is emphasized that uh, seldom, seldom in the five books of Moses is the phrase the Ten Commandments ever used. I think they're used four times in total. But how about the phrase the two tablets used more than 30 times? Seriously. And so, uh, for us, if we're going to be speaking about the Ten Commandments, you know, the God's message to mankind that was given to Moses on Mount Sinai, we would much more often speak of it as the two tablets than the Ten Commandments. And uh, here's the interesting thing. If I would say to anybody well-versed in ancient Jewish wisdom, if I'm going to speak about an object that is made up of two things containing ten or with a value of 10, what are you thinking of? And again, even a, a young person, well-versed in ancient Jewish wisdom, would say something that's made up of two, but that is that comprises 10, yeah, that's the 10 commandments. Because it's on two tablets containing 10 commandments. Therefore, when he gives her two bracelets, having a total value of 10 pieces of gold, yeah, okay. All right, so now we're getting somewhere. Don't think that this encounter at the well took place over the space of about 30 seconds, or for that matter, 30 minutes. It was several hours. And what was going on during those several hours? Well, it's very simple. But in order to explain to you what it was, uh, I have to first of all tell you the following. If a woman is planning matrimony to a man, She's hitching her wagon to him. She's really very much now in his hands. Right now, I know that people, oh, today in the gallery, everyone shares it's totally equal, marriage is totally equal. Look, I'm sorry, but the reality is that's simply not the case. She is going to be having the babies, not him. She is going to be throwing up in the first trimester, not him. She is going to be giving birth, not him. And when the child calls in the middle of the night, the child's going to say, Mommy, not Daddy. And that's only uh, a tiny proportion of the number of really critical distinctions. But again, something tells me that uh, to you listening, I probably don't have to belabor the point or spend a lot of time on that. Um, the point is that uh, you, when a young woman is planning matrimony with a man, uh, she needs to know certain things about him. I mean, for heaven's sake, ideally, if she could get a big fat contract, you know, about as long as the constitution of the European Economic Union, a thousand pages, containing what the couple agrees to in terms of handling every imaginable set of circumstances that they might confront during a long and fruitful marriage, that would be the best thing, wouldn't it, in theory? I mean, it's such an unknown. And because the good Lord has created an attraction between men and women, and it's an attraction that very often translates into the emotion of love, that women are able to persuade themselves love conquers all. And after all, all you need is love. And so instead of a thousand page contract saying, this is where we're going to live. This is how many children we're going to have. This is what our physical relationship is going to look like. Uh, how, what, and when. Uh, this is how we're going to relate to your parents and my parents. This is what our economic circumstance is going to be like. This is how we're going to apportion money between savings and spendings. Uh, this is what we'll do for vacations. This is how we'll name our children. This is what we'll do in the event of ill health. This is okay. All of this laid out in a big, long thousand page document. The, the miracle is that women are willing to marry you guys without getting such a legally binding document covering every possible conceivable circumstance. So how on earth can women do it? Well, my big concern is that they do it because of love. But how about smart women 
who know better than to marry because of love. Fine, so if you take love out of the equation, and now I'm not infatuated with you, so why am I marrying you? Especially if you're not giving me a thousand-page ironclad contract guaranteeing me what our life will look like. How can I possibly marry you, says any intelligent woman? And the answer is you can't unless you got the equivalent of a thousand-page contract. What is the equivalent? The equivalent is insight into and full understanding of the moral matrix to which this man subscribes. One of the reasons that women find men in uniform attractive is firstly, a man who wears a uniform, whether it's the military or even in in other areas, whether it's even fire or law enforcement, a man who wears a uniform, or the Coast Guard, particularly the Coast Guard, um, a man who wears a uniform is basically telling the world, I'm somebody you can count on, because other men count on me. His uniform speaks to a moral code to which he subscribes. That is enormously reassuring to a woman. But what if your man doesn't wear a uniform, right? Not everybody is serving in the military. Not everybody is working for the Coast Guard. So what happened? Well, it doesn't have to be a uniform. It has to be any guarantee of the moral code to which he subscribes. Religion is a fan- genuine religion. I'm not talking about uh, external affiliation. I'm not talking about somebody who dresses the part. I'm talking about somebody who has a real and deep commitment to God. And uh, if you ladies are involved with somebody like that, and it is genuine, you have a very reliable approximation of a thousand-page contract. And it is particularly true in a biblically-based Judeo-Christian environment. And uh, and essentially what, what that means, what a woman me- understands from that is that, well, okay, this man answers to a higher authority. And I'm happy, as long as I'm happy with that higher authority, that's good. In other words, I can't get a thousand-page contract from a man, right? Any intelligent woman knows that. But what happens if he has a boss who is going to determine the answer to every enigma that crops up, the boss who's going to determine how the couple is or how the man is going to behave in every set of circumstances. And the woman says, if I'm okay with that boss, then I'm okay with this man. That makes sense, right? It should do. And that's one of the reasons that uh, uh, my wife agreed to marry me because I committed before we got married. (laughs) For those of you who wonder what she ever saw in me or why she married me, as I wonder every day, uh, I committed before we met, and this is absolutely true and absolutely sincere. I wouldn't tell it to you otherwise. Uh, I committed to accept the ruling of my father on any issues that cropped up upon which we disagreed. And uh, I don't think we'd been married more than a year, maybe two years, before that got put to the test. In a situation in which I was absolutely sure my father would rule in my favor. But it didn't make any difference because I had committed before we got married to accept his ruling, whatever it was. As it turned out, he ruled, out, he ruled against me. And uh, in, in hindsight, with a few years gone by, I don't doubt for a moment that he was absolutely right. Uh, by the way... Uh, my father's been gone 25 years now, and for those of you who are interested uh, to know more about him and who are interested in, um, in, in what I wrote about him on his 25th the anniversary of his, uh, 25th anniversary of his passing, I wrote a thought tool called Transmission Chain. Transmission Chain. And if you go to our website at uh, www.rabbidaniellappin.com, uh, you will find that you can uh, go to a page marked Thought Tools, and then you get, you page down till you find Transmission Chain. And I wrote that on the occasion of my father's 25th, uh, the anniversary of his uh, passing 25 years later. But uh, anyway, that's the point I'm making. So 
if uh, if you want to get married to a man and you, uh, you sort of wonder what life will be like for but we're married to him which is a very legitimate thing you certainly have every right to want to know that then what you want to do is find out what is the system to which he subscribes what is the moral code that to which he is unshakably committed and then all you got to do is master that moral code and then you're going to know what life is going to be like with him it's absolutely reliable uh, it's not going to tell you what life dishes out to you it's not going to tell you about the unpredictables of life but it will tell you how he will respond to them and after all that's all you need to know and uh and so in response to the question of how does an intelligent, intelligent young woman like this Rebecca in chapter 24 of Genesis, how does she agree to go off with a man she's never met, to marry the son of his master whom she's never met? It's very simple. Because they sat there at the well and he gave her jewelry but the jewelry exemplified the time they spent together. The jewelry was one thing. But it was a symbol. And he said to her, here is a, uh, a, a ring, a beautiful ring, whose value is 172. This is something called the Ten Commandments, which hasn't yet been given to humanity. But my boss, Abraham, knows all about it. And what's more, he lives by it. And what's more, his son lives by it. So all I got to do is teach you this code of morality. And you will then know what you're marrying. And what's more, I'm going to give you two golden bracelets with a total value of 10, whatever it is, 10 pieces of gold, whatever, it doesn't matter, because this symbolizes two tablets containing 10 commandments. Again, I'm giving you two perspectives on the 10 commandments, and the result is that by the time we finish here and we walk back to your home where you are going to introduce me to your brother Laban and to your father Bethuel, you will really know what this proposal of marriage is all about. You will really know what you are being invited to join. And sure enough, in verse 58, the, the family says to her, come on, do you really want to go away with this man? Maybe you'll never see us again. To some, you're off now to some unknown. She says, yep, I'm ready to go. Well, why wouldn't she? She's never likely to get a clearer picture of where a man to whom she's hitching her wagon is headed. So that's exactly what she does. But still, why is the moral framework of the Ten Commandments presented to her in the context of gold? Well, let me tell you that in just a moment. Be right back. The website, RabbiDanielLappin.com. I want you to go there, please and uh, visit the store, see if there is anything that uh, I have created for you which could transform your life, and everything there provided you are in a, a mode where you need some kind of a blessing, you need some kind of change in your life in areas of uh, friendships, areas of family, parents, siblings, um, spouse, children, uh, or uh, in the area of finance, or in the area of, uh, of faith, your relationship with God, uh, there will be something there that has been created in a very practical way. This is not hairy-fairy stuff. This is not, uh, you know, um, pray and everything will be good. We're talking about very specific spiritual strategies in all of these er pardon me, in all of these areas. Rabbi Daniel .com. Look at the store. Uh, you might want to send us an email. You'll do that at rabbidanielappen.com. You might want to subscribe to Thought Tools to make sure you receive a weekly email from me. Go ahead, do all of that at that website, and I'll be right back with you. Yes, where you come to have revealed to you how the world really works, the Rabbi Daniel Lappen Show, I am your rabbi, and uh, I, I, I don't thank you enough, as much as I really should, for being part of the show, for listening to it. And uh, to those of you who've been passing it along and increasing the number of people who uh, subscribe or download or listen to the show, thank you especially. Much appreciated. And so why does the uh, scripture reveal that uh, Eliezer depicted 
the entire moral framework of the Bible to this prospective mother of the Jewish people in the form of golden jewelry. And that has to do with the fact that uh, way back in Genesis chapter 2, verse 12, you'll read a, a verse which reads, And the gold of that land was good. And this has to do with the idea that, uh, that well, um, people who regard money as evil, very suspect. Very suspect. In general, uh, people who regard money as evil are people who are busy trying to take it away from other people. People who work for their own money, people who make money, people who create money, usually don't think that it's evil. I'm just saying, you know what I mean? Politicians who speak about the rich must pay their fair share, or politicians who speak about the greed of people who just want to make money, run for your life because that's another 10 fingers trying to get in your wallet. Just be suspicious when people tell you how evil money is, because money isn't evil at all. Genesis chapter 2, verse 12, money is good, gold is good. And therein is the message that the servant of Abraham was conveying to Rebecca. Okay, so what am I talking about? This whole show has been dedicated to the proposition that if you're going to marry for money or for love, you're much better off marrying for money, ladies, not men. This is not addressed to men, but it is addressed to women. And why is that? Yes, there are men who are thoroughly unworthy scoundrels who, who have uh, put together a few dollars, no question about it. But there are fewer of them, far fewer in percentage terms of men, Far fewer bad men who've made money. Listen to me carefully on this. It's true. There are far fewer bad men who've made money than there are men who are willing to tell you they love you in order to have you. Do I need to repeat that? There are far fewer bad men who've made money than there are bad men who will say whatever they have to say to you in order to get you. Because in general terms, in order to make money, you have to deliver value. In order to make money, you have to deliver value to other people. That's what you've got to do. And so you will very often, you will very often have people who decry the money. I've, I've heard this, I mean, so often, very often. I mean, I speak at a lot of different churches around the country, and I'm very grateful to pastors and churches that invite me to speak. But very often in uh, questions and answer sessions afterwards, I spoke at a Christian university. I'll tell you which one it was. I spoke at Liberty University um, for Reverend uh, Falwell, um, Dr. Falwell Jr. I was very friendly uh, with his late father, uh, Jerry Falwell Sr. I'm friendly with the president of Liberty University. He was good enough to ask me to speak to a convocation. There were 12,000 students there, and I stayed for hours afterwards talking to individual students. And one of the things that, that came up again and again and again from several students is uh, uh, tr truly creative people do not get paid their value. Uh, there are all kinds of people who are very valuable people, and, and they don't get the the value they're entitled to. They don't get as much money. They they're artists. We know artists who are wonderful artists. They don't get what. Why should a banker get more money than an artist? And they have a lot of trouble with that idea. And uh, and I answer and I explain. Look, uh, there are only two possibilities here. Either outside people will tell you what you must value. Or you get to choose what you want to value. And if you prefer the latter, then you must adopt the system of money. What I mean by that is that, uh, that today in America, and heaven knows where on earth in the Constitution of the United States of America anybody found legitimacy for uh, the uh, national endowments for the arts. Where did they get the idea that the Constitution allows the federal government uh, 
to take money from hard working people in America and assign it to anointed artists. And so there are the most atrocious abominations standing in the lobbies and in the plazas and in the courtyards of federal buildings that have been paid for with money confiscated from a hardworking farmer in Kansas. Why? Because the government has decided that there is artistic value to that. This is why I love the monetary system. I don't want to be forced to pay for your idea of what is artistic. I'll pay for it myself if I think it has value. And I explained it to the students at Liberty University. I've explained it to people at churches that um, if the artist is creating something that people find no beauty in and no value and are not willing to part with their money for, that's fine. I'm perfectly willing to let people choose to do it that way. The artist is free to do whatever he wants, but he has no right to demand payment for it. He has to satisfy other human beings, just as I have to with you, and just as everybody who is participating in the godly designed economy, an honest, open, transparent, free market economy. If you do not satisfy God's other children, you don't have a right to claim money. Now, that may seem hard and rough and brutal, but it's not nearly as hard and as rough as as brutal as the alternative systems, particularly many that have tyrannized millions upon millions of people in the 20th century. And so, uh, um, you know, I I think of... um, a a Russian writer by the name of Dostoevsky. And uh, if I've ever been tempted to try and learn Russian, it's because I wanted to try and read his books in the original Russian, which I'm not able to do. But even in translation, I found enormous value in his books. Um, it's, it's, it's really interesting. He, um, he was arrested in 1849 because the czarist government uh, found him involved with, uh, uh, with, with some group of, of leftist intellectuals, whatever it was. He, he spent quite a while in prison. He was sentenced to death. And then at the last minute, the czar uh, gave him a pardon or something. But he still, he still ended up uh, spending horrible years in the gulag in Siberia. He really did. And uh, he had a very rough time. I think he spent about five years or thereabouts in the gulag. It was a terrible thing. And he ended up uh, writing um, novels. And you can tell that they're influenced to some extent by what he experienced in the gulag. One is called Crime and Punishment. These are are, are gems, by the way. Uh, Another one, another novel is called The Brothers Karamazov, which I think is even greater. And uh, the guy was terrific. But um, about, I don't know, maybe 10 years after he got out of the gulag, something like that, he wrote a novel called From the House of the Dead um, or Prison Life in Siberia. And uh, it's a fictional piece from, you know, describing his experiences there and, you know, obviously fictionized. But he has a phrase in there which has never left me. The phrase is, and I, I quote, Money is coined liberty, and so it is ten times dearer to a man who is deprived of freedom, even though he's not able to spend it. You follow what he's saying? Money is coined liberty. And isn't that true? When you have a few dollars, you truly have some independence. And one of the reasons that socialist governments try and make as many citizens dependent upon government handout as possible is because that way they retain control. The last, one of the things that governments hate are religious people and people with money because religious people serve only one boss, namely God, and people with money do not have to prostrate themselves before the little G of government. Money is coined liberty, and so it is ten times dearer to the man who is deprived of freedom, even 
if he cannot spend it. Uh, the actual the actual full phrase read I should give it to you in its accurate entirety. It's said Dostoevsky, money is coined liberty, and therefore it is ten times dearer to the man who is deprived of freedom. If money is jingling in his pocket, he is half consoled, even though he cannot spend it. And so, um, what what it is that uh, that I'm trying to describe is that although yes, there are people, there are scoundrels with money, and if a woman marries with money, it's possible that she should be she she could possibly end up with a scoundrel. Yes, it is possible. It is. But you still have to look at his track record, see what other men think about him. But all things being equal, if men think well of him and his track record is good, right? a man who has some money is a better bet for you women, far better bet than a man who says he loves you. Now, if the man has a few dollars and says he loves you and he's got a track record and a nice family and he's of good character, all right, that's wonderful, all the benefits. But what I'm saying is don't fall into the trap of thinking that money plays no role. I'm not even talking about the fact that every woman is entitled to expect the ability to build a home. And for that, it helps to have a few dollars. I'm not, only, I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking of the fact that the very fact that he has created some wealth stands to his good credit. It's a good thing. You know, uh, Ayn Rand in Atlas Shrugged uh, has a speech. It's a wonderful speech by uh, Francisco Danconio. And... Uh, and he writes, one of the things in the speech is, he says, let me give you a tip on a clue to men's characters. The man who damns money has obtained it dishonorably. The man who respects it has earned it. He says, so you think that money is the root of all evil, said Francisco D'Anconio. That's me reading from Atlas Shrug. Have you ever asked what is the root of money? Money is a tool of exchange which cannot exist unless there are goods produced and men able to produce them. Money is the material shape of the principle that men who wish to deal with one another must deal by trade and give value for money. Money is not the tool of the moochers who claim your product by tears or of the looters who take it from you by force. Money is made possible only by the men who produce. Is this what you consider evil? And so a man who's made money, and this is now, I'm not, I'm not, I finished quoting, a man who's made money has obviously cared about what other people need, and he understands what delivering value is, and he's cared about his employees, he's cared about his vendors, he's cared about his customers, because without concern for all those people, you cannot succeed. Yes, indeed, marrying for money even if nothing else, right? I've told you, ladies, I've told you the things that are important. I've told you that, yes, you do want to marry a man who is uh, neither a wimp nor a thug. You want to marry a man who has spine and heart. Uh, you, you want a man who is masculine. You want a man of good character and of good family. You, of course, you want all those things. But very often, women who marry for love have ignored all those other things. They haven't even given them any thought because they fell in love. And so if somebody is going to be as foolish as to marry for love, then let me tell you, you are not being any less foolish by marrying for money. You're not being any less foolish. And so my hope is that uh, next time you hear somebody say, oh, she just married him for his money, uh, speak up. Speak up and uh, tell them how mistaken that is and how much better it is than to hear somebody saying, oh, she just married him because she fell in love with him. See, we've been conditioned by the propaganda of the culture that when we hear, so, oh, she married him for love. Oh, that's so wonderful. No, it isn't. It's a calamity in the making, probably. Not always. Not always. But 
you stand a far, far better chance. Assuming you know nothing else about him other than number one, you fell in love with him, or number two, he's made some money honorably, go with a ladder, please. Marrying for money is by no means the worst thing in the whole world. It's far from it. It's certainly a whole lot better than marrying for love. Ideally, it's great when both exist. But to make the decision to marry while you are in a state of infatuation, or once you're already in a state of infatuation, fraught with peril. But I don't want to finish off on, on a negative note. I want to finish off on a positive note. Uh, obviously, um, there's so much to marriage and, uh, and the, uh, the idea of a commitment, particularly one that is made within the framework of an unbreakable moral code, that is the best guarantee of all. And I certainly hope that every woman contemplating marriage ends up with that. And that is certainly what Rebecca landed up with when she made the commitment to marry Isaac, whom she'd never yet met. But she didn't need to because she understood that his commitment to the Ten Commandments and to God's message to mankind was an unbreakable covenant. And that as long as her life with him was going to be governed by that, all would be well. And that really is what it's all about. He described that in the form of gold because, yes, money is part of that. And that's one of the reasons that in ancient Jewish wisdom, interestingly enough, we are told that after 120 years, when a man stands before his creator in judgment, the very first question is, did you conduct your business and monetary affairs honorably? Because... By and large, in a fair market and in an open economy, if a man has had many, many years of business success, the odds are that he conducted himself honorably because reputation is real. And most people are reluctant to do business with somebody with a bad reputation. And if people won't do business with you, <laughs> You're not going to make money. It's as simple as that. And that's why it is that um, marrying somebody for money, not at all a bad thing. Please don't disparage women for marrying for money. There's nothing wrong with it. Not Usually not the only thing, but for a woman to seriously take that into account, not the not a bad thing. And for a man who wants to be happily married, a man who wants to marry a terrific woman, to devote his early years to making money and educating himself and making himself capable of making money. This is all good, not bad. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being with me. And until we're together for the next show next week, I wish you a week of good health and, yes, prosperity. God bless you.